Hey, everybody, Justin Wu Lee coming in. So I got sent some cool information, having some deja vu here with some remote-controlled airplane crashes, uh, which were done several years and leading right up to 9-11. They had remote-control airplane crashes um, that the military was doing and the rest of it. And uh, here's one that was televised earlier this year in the U.S., Germany, and the U.K., Oh yes, we got some uh, footage of that for you. I'll go ahead and roll that right now. So yeah, there you go. And another interesting thing is that the Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 was never really found, was it? Kind of ironic in this age of uh, ground-penetrating radar, um, satellites that can zoom in on stuff like, you know, Google Earth and the rest of it. And uh, not to mention the all the drones they've got running around that can take very high-resolution pictures you know, like the Global Hawks and the rest of it, that can take very high-resolution pictures of whole freaking uh, major metropolitan areas and break your Fourth Amendment with that. But, you know, they're willing to break your Fourth Amendment spy on you, but heck, if they can't find a, a massive uh, passenger plane. So, yes, that went missing the 8th of March of this year. And the question is, is did they take that now disappeared plane, that off-the-books plane, assumed wrecked somewhere in the middle of the ocean plane, which they never really actually found any evidence of, um, did they take that, paint it up, retrofit it with some remote control hardware, and then crash it over the Ukraine to try and blame Putin for a whole bunch of different stuff and call it Malaysian Airlines Flight 17? Is that what they did? Because we know they used remote control airplanes for 9-11. Oh, wait, you didn't know about that? Oh, well, let me go ahead and roll this film for you. If you look at the routes of the hijacked planes on the morning of 9-11, you see that they didn't fly directly to their intended targets. Actually, none of the four planes chose a short flight path. Instead, they were all piloted in long detours and loops to New York and Washington. But why? Wasn't it a great risk for the hijackers to be captured by fighter jets on their strange and time-consuming detours? Why took they such an unnecessary risk? The 9-11 Commission didn't even ask the question, although there seems to be a reasonable solution. If you transfer the flight routes onto a map with a radar coverage of the northeastern United States, you see that three of the four flights directed their detours exactly to so-called radar gaps, meaning areas with extremely poor radar coverage. Only there the transponders were switched off. The transponder signal transmits the airliner's identity, speed and altitude to air traffic controllers. Without that signal, the controllers see, at best, only a nameless point on their screens. Flight 11 switched off its transponder seven minutes after the hijacking at 8.21, apparently exactly when the plane was crossing the border of the local radar coverage. Flight 77 switched off at 8.56, 
In this case, even the Washington Post reported about a radar gap, because the plane's signal was disappearing completely from the screens. Flight 93 also fits into this pattern. The plane's transponder was shut off only 13 minutes after the hijacking at 9.41, not earlier or later, but precisely when the airliner crossed a small area with extremely poor radar coverage. The obvious question needs to be addressed. How should Mohammed Atta and his associates have known the most intimate details of military and civilian radar coverage in the US? Details widely unknown even to air traffic controllers in charge on 9-11. And how should they have known by minute when their individual plane had reached such a radar gap? Finally, why didn't the 9-11 Commission even mention this issue? Perhaps one could guess, because it could lead to some speculation about the possibility of a central control. For there's a further aspect hardly going along with the official theory. The precisely simultaneous events shortly before 9 a.m. At 8.46 the first plane hit the World Trade Center. Only seconds later, at 8.47, the second plane changed its transponder code and thereby its identity. At 8.51 the second plane turned, at 8.54 the third plane turned, switching off its transponder at 8.56. So all these major events took place within only 10 minutes, orchestrated allegedly by hijackers actually unable to communicate to each others while aboard the individual planes. Then how did they do it? For they also couldn't rely on a fixed arrangement, because all three flights mentioned took off with unscheduled delays between 10 to 15 minutes. By pure logic, that leaves only two possible explanations for the strange simultaneousness. Accident or a central external control of the planes and their transponders. The reference to a possible remote control sounds like science fiction, but it's not. As early as 1984, a remote-controlled Boeing was intentionally crashed for a test by the US military. And in the 1990s, the Pentagon was pushing hard to develop JPELTS, the Joint Precision Approach and Landing System. Private contractor on this military project was Raytheon, one of the world's largest defense companies. In 2001, they were proudly reporting that they had safely remote-controlled a Boeing 727 in August of that year, meaning one month before 9-11. If and what difficulties would appear in remote-controlling a Boeing 757 or 767, the types that had been hijacked, has not been reported to this date. That nobody could have imagined something like this before 9-11 is in doubt, however. In March 2001, half a year before the attacks, Fox broadcasted the first episode of a new TV series called The Lone Gunman, where a commercial airliner is crashed into the World Trade Center by remote control. The script writers named the conspirators as being part of the US elite, by the way. Their aim, new wars and a massive and permanent increase in defense spending. So long for the TV movie from spring 2001, watched by a huge audience. And not only civilian scriptwriters showed prophetic fantasy. Also the military regularly exercised hijackings in plenty of different scenarios before 9-11. For example in June 2001 the suicide hijacking of an inbound flight as shown in a 2009 release document by the 9-11 Commission. Not to forget all the war games on the morning of 9-11 itself that strangely included a hijacking and fake inserts on the radar screens of the air defense, precisely while the real attacks were underway. The pure amount of these unexplained facts underlines the need for a new public investigation of the attacks. Well, there you have it, folks. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? Deja vu. Gotta love it. All right, all links will be attached. Have a good one. Take care.